Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Good morning. When I was a graduate student, we studied a speech, I believe it was by Wendell Phillips, called The Murder of Lovejoy, a masterpiece of eloquence. And its existence in that graduate class in the 1960s and early 70s is te a testament to the power of rhetoric to conserve narratives that tell stories that matter. And embedded in those stories are facts, but the power of the remembrance is not in the facts. The power of the remembrance is in the narrative. One of the things that we need to find ways to do is to conserve the narratives that encapsulize our facts into structures that we carry with us so that when we are confronted with a need to marshal that narrative, it is there and ready to impel our action. I walked into the National Press Club a long time ago, as we often do because many conferences are held there in Washington, D.C. I went to the top floor in the elevator, and there was the usual desk to pick up your credentials, and there was a journalist sitting behind the desk who said, here, you want one of these, and handed me a button. The button said, free Jason. I knew nothing about Jason, and I didn't know why we wanted him to be free. I did not know whether this was some kind of an appeal to rescue an animal. I did not know, I mean, think of all the ways in which you say free something. Along with that, there was a description of the cause. I put the button on. I did not know who Jason was before. I knew when I put the button on that I was carrying a narrative. My students were with me, put the button on. They live in a digital world more so than I do. They already were able to find a hashtag free Jason. So they started to be able to communicate using it in digital space. But I was still walking around in a world in which I could say I identify with this as a cause. And because of the piece of paper, I now saw the world differently as I read the Washington Post and learned more about his story. So I picked up factual information in the process of carrying the button. The button was the entree into me to a narrative. And as a result, I assimilated data differently because I had a structure that let me see those things as facts, as being important in a different way. And I knew how to structure them. And underlying that was the Washington Post's frame. The Washington Post's frame said, he is being jailed for the crime of journalism. And so we have one frame, he's being jailed because he's a spy. The crime is he's a spy. We have the other frame, which is he's guilty of the crime of journalism. By carrying the frame, he's guilty of the crime of journalism, I could recall the narrative. And I could set in place the facts that I picked up from the Washington Post's ongoing campaign. I could talk to others about it in the context of other journalists who had experienced comparable kinds of oppression at the hands of regimes that did not believe that journalism ought to be free or that Jason ought to be free. And in that context, I now could build an awareness of all sorts of other names whose narratives I had. One of the things that is important as we talk about fact checking is that we don't get lost in the trying to say that's true or that's false, that's misleading or that's not, and we stay in a structure of understanding of why the fact matters how the fact fits a frame, how the frame fits a principle, how the principle fits a narrative, and how the narrative tells us how we need to act and live our lives. To the extent that when I founded factcheck.org with Brooks Jackson, I called it factcheck.org, I think I did a profound disservice because it made it sound as if we care about fact. We don't care about fact, well we do, but we don't care about the fact in the way in which the name would suggest because it suggests that's an end in itself. What the fact-checking function in journalism is about is context setting. It is setting facts into structures that create understandings, that build out narratives that help us parse our world into which we can integrate new and different kinds of facts. And to the extent that we get into narrow, small enclaves in which people control those narratives, those frames, and hence those facts, we can't assimilate the facts in the other world because all they're doing is putting facts in against a narrative structure that can't hold them. So we need to find a way to build the narratives and create the coherence and also create the kind of axes, axes of understanding as a result that are important. And we need to wear our digestive message 
for me, free Jason is a digestive message. We also need to care about what we call what it is we're worried about. I really worry about people using the, the concept of fake news. I worry about it a lot. The biggest success of a person who has managed to traffic that into the national narrative has been getting journalists to use the label fake news. When a journalist uses the, word, word, the phrase fake news, the journalist indicts his or her own enterprise. There is no such thing as fake news. If it's fake, it is not news. News is self-correcting by definition. So let's not say that something is fake news, thereby taking some of the meaning of news that we ought to cherish and stripping away the bark off of it so that it no longer is what it needs to be. We need an alternative vocabulary. I would call what Josh studies imposter news. He's studying sites that pretend they are news sites. They take the banner that looks like news. They take names that sound like news. They take typesets that look like news. They format to say they look like news. And they trick people into thinking they're news. They're imposter news. They're not fake news. The noun for me is imposter. And then I'd put news in quotation marks because they're not news. Imposter is the controlling noun. I want another noun, however, and I want another noun combination for the thing that I worry about in the digital age. I worry when this kind of content that is deceptive goes viral outside the capacity of journalists to screen it, to hold people accountable for it, outside the capacity of opposing candidates and those opposing ideas to take it and gra grapple with it and knock it down. I worry as a result about its virality and about our capacity inside our enclaves to spread it uncritically, not knowing perhaps that we have been deceived. I want to call that viral deception VD, venereal disease. <laughs> Take the concept of venereal disease for just a moment. How many of you would like it? <laughs> if you got it, how many of you would want to share it? <laughs> if you saw it, what would you want to do with it? Cure it, quarantine it. I want to take the negative affect attached to VD, call this viral deception VD, and say, when we see it, we don't share it. When we see it, we try to kill it. And if we're going to kill it, we're going to need those frames and those narratives that will wrap it into a large explanatory context that will let us knock it down decisively. We did a meta-analysis of disinformation and misinformation and how it can and cannot be corrected. I published it with Dolores Alparasin. It digests to one sound bite for me. Don't refute misinformation and disinformation. Displace it. Put in place an alternative context of understanding that is complex and deep, and as a result, lets people anchor within it and then see facts through it. And that's the reason for saying we need narratives and frames and structures into which we set this misinformation so that it is not just dispatched in the moment. The danger always is, as you try to refute it, you inadvertently reinforce it. But rather, you create a frame of understanding that says, when it comes trafficking into your website, wait a minute, you don't get into my world. My narrative here doesn't let you in. My narrative is anchored in discernible reality. With that as a preference, my task is understanding what the Russians did in the 2016 election. I'm going to focus intensely on only one part of an argument. And I'm going to do it because when I looked at this conference, the first thing I said was, this is democratic engagement in action. This is a community that has managed across time to sustain high-level intellectual inquiry on topics that matter not necessarily to the nation and the globe, but to do so in an environment in which virtually every place you turn in this community, someone is helping make this possible. So someone said yesterday, are you going to have any kind of a positive message? Here's my positive message. Thank you, Camden, for putting this conference together. And that means the people who are running the best technical operation I have seen in the whole time I've been doing this, and I'm an elderly woman. <laughs> The wonderful people who made something special because someone on my staff checked lactose intolerant. <laughs> and Pete, who is standing by waiting to play Donald Trump in the event that my video doesn't play and I have to call on him to stand in for Donald Trump. <laughs> 
So do we have positive news? Yes, here's my digest. If my digest for protect press, press freedom is free Jason and keep him free, my digest for democratic engagement, and I have a positive message, is Camden Conference. <laughs> there are many people here who have focused on the various ways in which journalism has changed and information dissemination has changed. And all of that research is incredibly important and very important as one is trying to understand this change media environment. But one of the findings that has always intrigued me as we watch people parsing out this world is one that was featured briefly yesterday. And that is increasingly we're looking to sources that we can trust. We have to because we can't be experts across the board in everything, and as a result, we're tending to go back into an older gatekeeping model. That places real burdens on those who are still trying to protect traditional journalism. And I'm coming here with a constructive, respectful critique of the way in which it behaved in 2016. I want to start out by saying it was a tough situation to be a journalist in 2016 and have hacked content dropped in your newsroom. There's a wonderful report by the Associated Press that tried to, cap, to kind of give you a sense of what it was like to have thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of information simply dropped in a newsroom. And that AP piece talked about all the resources that had to be deployed toward it. When you deploy toward it, you're deploying away from other things that could have been covered. So the first Russian effect isn't what we saw inside the media streams that we were following, it was all the stories that didn't get written because they were trying to make sure that they had domesticated this source of information that simply flooded newsrooms. The second effect of this disinformation was the effect it had on the Clinton campaign personnel. And as we look forward to future elections, my theme is going to be journalists. We have a special role here. But what happened inside the Clinton campaign was the private exchanges of individuals were put in public. How many of you would like to see the last, say, five years of your email stream simply dumped into public view? And in the process, journalists' contacts with the campaign were disclosed as well, opening journalists to other forms of critique. So suddenly, communications that were assumed to be private were made public in an environment in which they were being selectively manipulated by being deployed strategically throughout the campaign. And the journalists had to decide what is and is not newsworthy. And I'm not here to say don't ever use hacked content because much of what we get that holds governments accountable comes to us through those kinds of channels. They don't necessarily come to us through channels which have the cleanest of hands. And nonetheless, you get accountability about things such as treatment of prisoners at Guantanamo out of material that was gotten by being leaked, for example. Now, granted, hacking puts you in a different category legally. Set that aside for a moment. I want to say I understand that journalists don't start from the presumption that they shouldn't cover it. They start from the presumption they should. And I will argue, yes, they should. But they need to do it in a way that is mindful of the challenges that are being posed, first, by the amount of it, and secondly, by the fact that it may not be coming to them in the same way that some of the other things come to them. Think the Pentagon Papers. Suppose you thought that the Pentagon Papers might have been selectively released and only some things disclosed. Suppose that you thought that there was some possibility that it might be forged material. Would you not now treat the Pentagon Papers differently? Well, historically, in retrospect, that document dump stands up extraordinarily well and had high levels of very responsible accountability attached. But you don't know when something comes from a hacked source through Julian Assange and WikiLeaks to the public that they haven't altered the information someplace in the stream. And so now there's an additional challenge for the journalists. So I want to start by saying it's tough for journalists to be there, and I grant that. And in a campaign environment in which now there are not one or two major competitors, but a whole world in which someone is going to put it up there and write about it. If you don't, there also are competitive pressures. And I'm going to argue that what the traditional legacy mainstream needs to do is not to satisfy in the face of those pressures, but to maintain its standards of accountability, its standards of what constitute good journalism, because it still has enough weight in our collective ecosphere that if it is handled responsibly there, that is something of a ballast against all of those other uses. It doesn't mean they're not going to be there. It doesn't mean they're not going to have effects. But you can, if you can trust that journalistic enterprise, 
The people who are trying to advocate for facticity and being in touch with discernible reality and accountability and good accountability standards can point to it and trust it. And the problem I have in 2016 is in some cases you couldn't do that with the mainstream journalism. And I'm going to argue that mainstream journalism's treatment of hacked content actually may have created an electoral effect, which is the last thing that a journalist is trying to do. By the way, just parenthetically, I want to take exception to the notion that fact checkers are liberal. It's mentioned briefly yesterday. I read factcheck.org. I founded it with Brooks Jackson. Yes, I am self-interested. There are fact checkers who vote a liberal ballot. There are fact checkers who support liberal candidates. But fact checkers are journalists. And a good journalist has norms in place that overcome human biases, that increase the likelihood that those biases are not at play. And if you can say about fact-checking, it is liberal or conservative, that is, it has an ideological bent to it, then those norms and that role have failed us. And I can I explain in Q&A, if you would like, what we do at Fact Check to try to protect against our human biases, but journalism does it in general. And so I worry when people assume that fact-checking is liberal, because just because you find more things that are factually suspect on one side doesn't mean that you're a liberal. It could be that you've screened out all the things on your side, it also could mean that that side has more facticity problems. <laughs> Analysis. The first thing the press failed to do was to source the WikiLeaked, in quotes, content to the Russians or to Julian Assange. It largely became WikiLeaks, not Julian Assange or the Russians. After October 7th, 2016, we knew the Russians had done the hacking. The journalism reports should have said Russian hacked or Russian illegally gotten and should have pointed out that Julian Assange was on record opposing the Clinton candidacy. At the point at which the press saw that Assange was strategically timing his material, that is, it wasn't being dropped out sequentially in terms of the chronology in which it actually occurred in real time, they should have put extra barriers up by saying, and Assange appears to be strategically leaking this in order to damage Hillary Clinton. The press largely did not. There are a few exceptions. They simply said WikiLeaks. They did it because WikiLeaks was a trusted source. WikiLeaks had provided content in the past that had been leaked content that had proved reliable. They downplayed or ignored the October 7th confirmation that the Russians were behind the hacking. On October 7th, you have the confirmation by the Department of Homeland Security and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Russians are behind the hacking. You then have the Access Hollywood tape breaking. Then you have same day, same afternoon, you have the first drop of the Podesta emails. The news agenda has now three things on its plate, two of them damaging to Donald Trump. It the news media agenda drops the first, the Russian sourcing of the hacking, and basically plays the Podesta tapes against the Access Hollywood tape. In the process, they lost the sourcing. Key premise of journalism, you tell us where you got it. You tell us that you've independently confirmed it, or you tell us you haven't been able to, so we know how much certainty you have about it. Third problem, they failed to note the lack of independent verification. Largely, the materials were unquestioned by the Clinton campaign. At a certain point, reporters, I think, legitimately assumed if there was something to be contested, the Clinton campaign would have contested it. I would argue, nonetheless, all the way through the campaign because they hadn't independently verified. They owed the public saying, this is Russian stolen content released through Julian Assange of WikiLeaks. I realize this is long, but journalists know how to write in concise fashion, so they can do this much better than I. And also to indicate we have not been able to independently verify the authenticity. Hacked content was not subject to tests of newsworthiness. I invite you to go back and look at the hacked content that got the headlines I'm going to feature in a moment and ask how much of that now sustains the test of newsworthiness. And I know part of what's happening is what's hidden is always presumed to have value. So, for example, when the, the Clinton speech extracts become public because she has not made them public, faced with recurrent requests by Bernie Sanders, there's the assumption she was hiding something. So there's an assumption, a narrative, that makes it more likely that that's not going to be subject to the test of newsworthy. It's going to be presumed that there is something suspect here, but there still is the test to say, is there? Had content altered the media agenda? There are two different ways in which reporters can inadvertently affect electoral outcomes. When you create an imbalance in messaging, so there's a lot of negative messaging about one side and less about the other side, imbalances in messaging shift votes on the margin. When you focus on some narrower range of topics, 
If those narrow range of topics disadvantage a candidate, you shift votes on the margin. By focusing on the hacked content, they increased the amount of negative material in the news media stream against Hillary Clinton. By focusing on the content of those things that were scandal tied, and that's in quotes, they increased the likelihood that as you considered Hillary Clinton, you were thinking in terms of those scandals and not in terms of the other things that could have been in the media agenda. The second way in which the news media affects our votes is by telling us what to think about, and that's topical. So to the extent that they focus us on the Clinton emails and what's in them, they are telling us that that's important in our vote consideration as we look at the other matters. And at key moments, reporters took hacked content out of context. Let me take a look at altering the media agenda. These are headlines referring to WikiLeaks. This is WikiLeaks interest, which remained high while Access Hollywood declined. How did the press respond? The overhyped coverage of the hacked emails was the media's worst mistake in 2016, one sure to be repeated if not properly understood. Thank you, David Leonhardt. That's a very important statement. I hope the newsrooms have thought through what they did and asked themselves in retrospect, what would we have done differently, and then projected ahead and said, if we get hacked content, whether about the right, the left, or someplace in between, how are we going to handle it in a way that is as responsible as it could be? I didn't argue that it appeared the emails were stolen by a hostile foreign government that had staged an attack on our electoral system. I didn't push to hold off on publishing them until we could have a less hairy discussion. I didn't raise the possibility that we'd become puppets in Putin's shadowy campaign. I chose the byline. Again, thank you, Amy Chozik, because you're telling me you're aware of it, which means you're telling me you're less likely to have it happen again. How did the press respond? This is the Pulitzer Prize winning team at the New York Times. Every major publication, including the Times, published multiple stories citing the DNC and Podesta emails posted by WikiLeaks, becoming a de facto instrument of Russian intelligence. Notice, it's posted by WikiLeaks. Even this self-aware Pulitzer Prize winning team doesn't have Assange and doesn't have the Russian stolen content inside its soundbite. Doesn't mean that self-awareness isn't good, it is. Newsrooms need to have thought this through and have articulated and implemented the practices that will mean that they will do better next time. The effect. Hillary Clinton, there's nothing bad that happens to Hillary Clinton after we find out that she was covering up pneumonia and after the deplorables content um, statement, other than hacked content and performance in debates. So look across everything and say, what's new in all of this? What's new is the stuff that comes through the hacked content. Well, we have baked in the deplorables statement. And we have baked in the fact that she was covering up pneumonia before this survey that I'm reporting is fielded. Across the period in which you have maximum hacked exposure through mainstream as well as conservative media, what you see is perception of who's qualified to be president. The answers to her drop at a statistically significant level. That drop predicts a reduced likelihood to vote. You also see she loses her advantage on shares by values and trustworthiness. The only place that she holds her advantage on temperament She's holding it because she's advertising on that theme, and advertising is creating a message imbalance on that theme that favors her. Now, this is an argument by correlation. I can't show causation, but what I can say is, find me something else that's happening during that time that would predict these changes other than that kind of massive exposure. At key moments, they took tagged content out of context. We were warned when we were putting together our slide decks that we shouldn't give you lots of things to read and we shouldn't give you lots of detail. I apologize to the organizers. <laughs> the, reason, the reason I want you to read this is I want you to see what WikiLeaks hacked content gotten from a memo by the Democratic staff of Hillary Clinton that was circulating internally to point the top high command of the Clinton staff toward potential statements that could be problematic. I want you to read what the actual hacked content said, because the effect that I'm going to show you is not of the hacked content. It is the hacked content taken out of context. So first, this is what WikiLeaks posts. WikiLeaks, this is Julian Assange, is framing these two things. They're framing the first speech to have said, you need to have a public and private position. They're framing the second as a paid secret speech to bank my dream is a hemispheric comment market with open trade and open borders. Now, WikiLeaks, and you'll notice I don't think highly of them, has actually left a comma there 
which invites you to go down and to say, what's after the comma? WikiLeaks has actually given you some sense that there's some other context surrounding this. But remember, you're really busy. There's a whole lot of material that you're being forced to move through as a reporter. And we've got the presidential debate coming up on Sunday the 9th. This is Friday the 7th. You've got to get your Sunday shows ready. The Sunday shows are going to create a powerful framing effect. And well, there it is. There's the statement. There's the same. WikiLeaks framed these two statements to be taken out of context. This is what the actual text says. Notice it's a speech to the National Multi-Housing Council. So if you interpret public-private as, I'm talking to the Wall Street banks now, and I'm telling them I'm going to gut Dodd-Frank, well, that's just wrong. You just have to sort of figure out how to get back to that word balance. She's extemporaneously speaking. How to balance the public and private efforts that are necessary to be successful politically. And that's just not a comment about today. If you saw the movie Lincoln and how he was maneuvering and working to get the 13th Amendment passed, and he called one of my favorite predecessors, Secretary Seward, who had been the governor and senator from New York. He ran against Lincoln for president, and he told Seward, I need your help to get this done. But if everybody's watching, you know, all the backroom discussions and the deals, you know, then people get a little nervous, to say the least. So you need both a public and private position. That is not about Wall Street banks. That is not about I'm taking any position in public that I'm now privately repudiating. And this is according to the memo that is being accurately capsulized. It's being simply put out by WikiLeaks. Here's the second debate. The hack content is released the 7th. It's Friday. It's the end of the day. This is Sunday. This is Sunday evening. This question involves WikiLeaks' release of purported excerpts of Secretary Clinton's paid speeches, which she has refused to release, and one line in particular in which you, Secretary Clinton, purportedly say you need both a public and private position on certain issues. So, two from Virginia asks, is it okay for politicians to be two-faced? Is it acceptable for a politician to have a private stance on issues? Sources matter. In presidential debates, the moderator stands in for journalism. And the public assumes that when a moderator says that a candidate said something, the moderator is accurately praising that statement. And making the assumption as well that it's not out of context. You can trust the journalist. Martha Raddatz is a fine journalist, but this is a mistake. In this context, the public hears you said this without having the context. And Clinton is now put in the position of saying, but that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about Lincoln, at which point Donald Trump says now she's lying about Lincoln. Second instance. Now I'm going to go to the Sunday talk shows. Remember, Friday the 7th, the Podesta content is released. You've got these hacked speech segments. This is a speech segment memo that is hacked, has been released as part of this, the Russian stolen, illegally gotten material. This is what ABC, now we're doing the Sunday morning news shows, one of the most prestigious venues in journalism. My dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders sometime in the future with energy that is as green and sustainable as we can get it, powering growth and opportunity for every person in the hemisphere. That's ABC News. Congratulations, ABC. You put the whole sentence up there. Thank you. There's Face the Nation. Now, I don't think someone said, let's take her out of context. I think someone working really quickly with a whole lot of content took the framing that came through WikiLeaks and had already been picked up in print journalism between that Friday and that Sunday. Here's CNN. In 2013 speech, Clinton told an audience that her dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade, open borders. They have ellipses. Here's Fox. Clinton on trade. My dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade, open borders. They've got the ellipses. That happened 14 pages away. She said those two things. They were not proximate to each other. Third debate, October 26th. In a speech you gave to a Brazilian bank for which you were paid $225,000, we've learned from the WikiLeaks that you said this, and I want to quote, my dream is a hemispheric common market with open trade and open borders. So is that your dream, open borders? Well, and she basically says, that's, I said more than that. I said, 
sometime in the future, Western Hemisphere, and then I talked about energy. And her answer sounds disingenuous, and Donald Trump says, there she goes again. The flaw here is in the journalist not honoring a journalistic norm, and it's made harder for the journalist to honor that norm because there is pressure. The early framing was picked up uncritically in the first print pieces and had carried into the Sunday shows. By the time they're preparing for these debates, it is a received wisdom that she actually said it. We had fact-checked the open border statement because Donald Trump continued to say that Hillary Clinton said she supported open borders, and factcheck.org continued to say she isn't saying that in anything that we have that's public. As soon as we got this content, we went and found these speeches, and we said she's not saying it there either. Meantime, do candidate Donald Trump tweets out, see, I knew she was doing it all along. Basically, the fact-checkers are wrong. So now we're in a situation in which it is mainstream journalists who are abetting a Russian theft through a leak of an intermediary who's strategically using it to disadvantage one candidate. It's understandable that they did it, but it is problematic that they did it, and we need to figure out how it doesn't happen to another candidate again. Those of you who are Donald Trump supporters, it could have happened to Donald Trump. If you had to look historically at which side you would have guessed the Russians would have intervened in order to oppose, you would have guessed the Russians would have opposed the Republican. We need to be able to step back from our biases about who should have been elected. This is not a speech about who should normatively have been elected. It is about ensuring that we protect the informational stream by which the electorate makes decisions. Why this is so devastating is for the, from Donald Trump, open borders was a digestive statement. It was the equivalent of free Jason for protecting freedom of the press. It stood for refugees coming in in large numbers. People engaging in criminal activities coming across borders in large numbers. And you can fill in all of the other blanks. Open trade, Hillary Clinton has vulnerability on because she's changed her position on trade. But she's not, at that point, supporting anything called open trade either. But it's the open borders that is the digestive statement that is dominant not only in the speeches of Donald Trump, but also in his advertising. So when a journalist and then journalists legitimize the idea that in private she says she stands for it, but in public she disavows the position, you now have called into question the candidate's integrity, and you've basically effectively, as a journalist, established, because if the public believes the mainstream because they trust the sources, because that's how gatekeeping works, and because we have to work through those shortcuts because we can't do all this checking ourselves, then in effect, the press has become a vehicle for advancing a Trump talking point when in fact the evidence does not underscore that inference or that conclusion. We compare debate viewers to non-viewers in the presence of controls. We ask, and we never get the opportunity to do this. We actually had a statement, says one thing in public, another in private, that is right out of the hacked content. It's right inside the news streams. We asked which candidate, of each candidate, says one thing in public, another in private. What you're seeing is a statistically significant change after each debate, comparing viewers to non-viewers in the presence of controls, and those who say Hillary Clinton says one thing in public and another in private. And that, like the other changes that I showed you earlier on qualification, on shares my values in Austin, trustworthy, independently pred predicts a reduced likelihood to vote. Conclusion, we are going to have hacking. It is a fact of life. It is going to be dumped on journalism. That's a fact of life, too. Sometimes it's going to be really important that it get out there. And it might not even be about candidates. It could be about something else in which we're engaging traditional accountability journalism. But there need to be rules in place to handle it. We need to determine where did it come from? What is the motive behind this? Has it been altered? What is the strategic intent of the timing of the releases? Is there any reason to suspect that we're being manipulated? We have to be told the sourcing and how it was gotten. We have to know, has the journalist independently verified? And the journalist needs to continue to try to independently verify. And even after the journalist surmises, I believe accurately, about the Clinton hacked content, the Clinton campaign hacked content, and the DNC hacked content, that it was accurate, we still need to keep that journalistic norm in place. And we need to ensure that newsworthiness standards are applied consistently across all candidates and campaigns, including hacked content. And we have to make sure that content isn't taken out of context. Thank you.